Hi folks, I wanted a better way to walk through these rubber strips. It was so annoying to have them catch your safety glasses or a tripod, so we came up with the ARS, the Automatic Rubber Strip Egress. Shout out to Morgan Olaf for the awesome name suggestion. So how does this work? It uses the two gears that we made in a past Wednesday widget. It uses a Bimba rodless pneumatic cylinder and some slide rails, just like you'd have out of a kitchen cabinet drawer, and finally, some Arduino code. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. First up, machining what we call the center plate. And this is awesome because it's one of the first projects that we've done on the YouTube channel where you've got so many different parts and so many different setups. And it actually really does do a good job of showing the value of having integrated CAD and CAM. And I'll be honest, this project did grow in scope. I didn't think it would require this many pieces and individual parts and setups. So being able to iterate, and we just started with something and kept adding parts and adding brackets and adding sensors uh, as we needed to, ended up working out great. We won't go into all the individual speeds and feeds because you can click here for the card to the NYC CNC website where you can grab this file that has both the CAD and the CAM setups. One little quick tip, if you didn't know it, you can move the vise jaw to the outside position. Here we're using the Tormach 5 inch vise. We actually don't mind using the 6 inch vise on a 770, but we're actually out of 6 inch vises. They're all in other machines right now, so no big deal. Make do with the 5 inch here. Next up, the left slider bar. Here's a Fusion tip. If you click on it, you can see I've got the setup and the stock and the part. If I wanna see that though in isolation, hop back into Model or CAD. If I click on it once, that part will show up in the list with some marching ants or little dots underneath it. So right here, left strip rail. And if I right click, I can choose Isolate and that will leave that part only visible Hop back into cam, much cleaner when we're trying to analyze tool paths. This stuff is pretty simple here. You can see though when we faced it, we faced it in a very unusual way and that's because we were out of x-axis travel. So if you go into edit, passes, you change your pass direction to 90 degrees, it'll cause it to effectively face in the y-axis direction and this is also really helpful when you're trying to maximize machine travel to get the largest part you can out of your machine. Also great use of the mod vise, and we threw some hockey pucks underneath just to give a little bit of extra stability here uh, as we're bridging a pretty long, thin part. Next up, the Bimba end bracket. I will right click on the left strip rail, choose unisolate. That brings everything back and I'll click on this bracket once. I can see that's what got highlighted. I'll right click, isolate that. And I wish we had that same functionality here in cam. I wish you could click on the part and have any cam operation that uses that body uh, show up. We don't have that just yet though, unfortunately. Through our piece of raw material in a mod vise. I like Ed's trick here. Just a really quick scale, mark, scribe a center, kind of like how you'd find the center of a piece of round bar, plenty close enough when we are machining all the way around the periphery of the part. And the super glue trick. Seriously, folks, this has been one of the best work holding tricks we have ever come across. I wish I knew about this years ago. The tape is what makes it so fun and so key card here to the Wednesday widget where we show all the little tips and tricks and details on that, but pretty impressive how much you can machine, how aggressive you can machine it really makes a nice setup and a workflow.
Next up, we've got to do some holes and other work on the ends of, of multiple of these pieces. So we threw a quick stop in our vise, actually on a 440 here, and that's just nice because it lets you keep the same work coordinate system and you don't have to grab your Heimer to relocate. So you can throw a bunch of parts in and out, even if you're doing different types of work or drilling or thread milling or whatever, and, and not have to again reset zero. Next up is this thing called a linking plate. This is a great trick when you're working with any sort of a belt system. So as you can see here, we double the belt over on itself. And because it's a tooth belt, that tends to work fairly well. Use zip ties to secure it in place. And the left side is fixed around a screw. The right side is the same way, except it's on a slotted system. And then you just use a zip tie yet again to pull those two together to keep them taut. Another great example of using a super glue, relatively thin part no practical tolerances whatsoever but of course we want nice surface finishes and you still want a rigid setup to promote good tool life let's put it together so we learned a lot of things in this project and look this is for fun i love this stuff this is exactly the kind of thing i've always dreamed about doing which is i want a door that automatically opens to me and it's customizable and it's fun and it's cool there's also a lot to take away from whether it's bringing a product to market or entrepreneurship about understanding how do you how do you get something made and how do you go about doing it and kind of tying into that fail fast fail cheap here get your parts made touch the part use it, work it, see it, understand it. We have a machine shop, so it's easy for us to machine brackets. You could also 3D print them. And again, link in the video description to things like the McMaster car rails, relatively inexpensive, super quick to get something like this, put together, test it, and feel it. We've also generally found that it's not worth tapping a lot of material, especially on a project like this, because so often we already have the through hole drill size in the machine or we can interpolate it out, and then we just use fasteners with nuts on the backhand side. It's so much quicker. <laughs> So what is that guy? That's the sensor we're using to detect the presence of a person in a very specific way. So let's take a time out from the assembly and look at the Arduino code. What I love about this is it's actually really simple code. We only have to install one library and that's for the VL53L0X sensor. What is that? It's a time of flight sensor. And there's two reasons that this is the right sensor to detect a person's presence in this project. Number one, they're really fast and I wanted a fast response time so that when someone's approaching the door, it can act appropriately and respond quickly. The second reason is that they offer a really focused beam. And that was the goal of this project was to try to not have distractions or peripheral movement trigger the door. We've got two sensors, one on the shop side, one on the office side. We've set up the threshold ranges here of how far do we want it to trigger. It's currently set to 3,000 millimeters or about 120 inches. My experience is this is much more a situation specific adjustment. In other words, worry less about the distance and more about what works. A couple other variables. Again, we've commented the code and it's available to download on the NYC CNC website. And if you're new to Arduino, there's two sections. There's the setup. And what this does is a one-time initialization when you sort of boot up or turn on the Arduino. And after that, there's the loop section. The loop is continuously looping through and always running that code again in a loop. And when you hear things like megahertz, that has to do with how often it can calculate and loop through per second. Pretty amazing because when you think about, oh, it's looping through, so is that a slow process? Well, Arduinos, relatively inexpensive, can still loop through code thousands of times per second. So in the setup, we're defining some relays, we're setting some pin modes in and out. What's important here and a little bit different is we're initializing the first time of flight sensor and these talk over what's called an I2C protocol. So it's a little bit different than your basic serial or digital. What's nice is that it takes care of a lot of the heavy lifting without us having to worry about it. And we're actually starting the sense in the setup and that's different. Normally we would start that sensing process in the loop, but here we're starting again, the sensor one and sensor two in the setup, we then hop into the loop. Super simple. We have a first statement, which is if sense, and if that looks strange, that's the same as saying if sense is true. What is sense? Well, if we scroll up, 
we started with setting it equal to true. So this first condition is satisfied right away. We'll see it come up later. And having the two ampersands is this condition where it has to meet both of these criteria. Sensor.reading range is less than or equal to the sensor range. And then sensor read range continuous is less than or equal to sensor range. And that same line of code for sensor two, the two vertical brackets here are an or statement. When that condition is met, all that we do is we set sense equal to false and open equal to true. So it's looping. So the next bit of code here, if open, and we, that's all we say, but that's the same as saying if open equals true or is it in that current state, what do we want to do? Digital write a relay low. That's going to activate the door to open. We're going to pause for 600 milliseconds and then we're going to deactivate the door open valve. So the air action has happened, but we're going to leave the door open. The door does not close in this code, but rather the code waits to see when the close loop, when the close if statement is satisfied. And it's basically the opposite of the statement above here. What it's looking for is the close state to be true, which we know it is because we toggled that when we opened the door. And it looks with both sensors to make sure somebody's not within range. So what this means is the door will actually stay open if you're standing inside of the door frame. One thing that's different in the closing loop here is we're doing a reset function. This is equivalent to a hardware reset. It only happens when the door actually closes. And this, in our experience, gives us much more reliable code. There's some relay noise and other errors that we found could just kind of accumulate. And having the Arduino do, again, a hardware reset when the door closes really increases long-term reliability. Okay, we're back for some more final assembly. It's always the devil in the details, putting together here a Nano. Uh, we're using a couple of the Beefcake relays to toggle the five-way pneumatic solenoid that allows us to properly open and close the rodless cylinder. Ed did a great job coming up with this way of hanging the rubber strips. We wanted them to be able to actually sway just a little bit. Grab some McMaster bushings, press them through some plasma cut steel brackets, threw them on a mini pallet with a really, really quick and dirty fixture just to locate some consistent holes across the batch of all of these. Put a notch in one end and clean up the other end, again doing a batch of these. And then finally, grab me something that I haven't used since the New York days, which was a Grizzly Vice press brake thing. And our die accuracy here just didn't quite have enough oomp. Um, Ed was using a mark on the vice to get a pretty consistent bend. And actually, these looked great. Again, quick and dirty, kind of getting back to uh, that garage shop. Let's figure out how to make it happen with the tools that we've got. And finally, the debut of our new laser. So we picked up a 100 watt uh, Boss laser. Ed was actually spending a lot of time over our local makerspace. They've got an 80 watt laser there. Uh, we were engraving stuff that we had anodized. We were cutting some rubber, cutting some acrylic, cutting wood for templates, jigs, lean stuff in the shop, more to come on that. So it became a no brainer to pick up a CO2 laser. So this will not cut metal. It will etch away things like paint and anodizing and it's a beast at anything like acrylic and wood and rubber as well for our fixture plate covers. We've had it about two weeks now and we've used it a ton. Like setup jigs, like templates, like the acrylics here, we end up using it as well to hold some sensor position brackets. Really, really great tool to have. And if you don't have one in your home shop, see if you can find a local makerspace. Uh, they seem to be more and more common these days. So what you're looking at is a, a false wall, and this is something I just didn't have the foresight to, to, to think about when we did the renovations to our shop, but it's a roll-up door. I didn't want to leave the roll-up door open because it creates a lot of noise, and there's an HVAC system in the office that's different than the shop, and it really does create some problems. So putting the roll-up door down, though, creates a problem because it's the path of least resistance to go between the shop and the video room or my office or Julie and Ed's office, etc. So the solution was to build that false wall with a man door in it, but I didn't want a man door. I wanted something clear that was quick and efficient. Uh, so we threw up the rubber strips for a while. Those got super annoying to walk through, which is why we've got the arse.
So we had to cut one more piece of acrylic. Ends up that the sensor doesn't really work uh, at the sort of overhead position on the shop side. So in this case, no big deal. Just got this acrylic strip that lets us mount the sensor at about chest height, which gives it a consistent triggering when you're approaching the door with one exception, which is Judd. So maybe we'll move this down to floor level. Should catch somebody's feet or ankles uh, just fine, and that would open it for Judd as well. He's fine walking through the rubber strips in the interim though. So again, folks, hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed. Even if you don't wanna make this identical project, what I'm hoping is that you can learn something from either the nature of this sort of a project or the code or the application and leverage it into something else. Again, Fusion File, Arduino code over on NYC. Otherwise, folks, take care. See you next Wednesday.